The following episode deals with explicit descriptions of violence that can be disturbing or distressing to some listeners. These include descriptions of murder and torture, possible mentions of death, suicide, and rape, and sound effects that recall violence and gunfire. If you want to skip these parts of the podcast, timestamps with specific trigger warnings can be found on our website or on the description section. Please be advised. The thing about martial law under Marcos was just the sheer dread. You never knew who was going to be next. If it was going to be your student buddy who tends to complain a bit loudly about his politics. A farmer friend from back home in the province who plans to participate in the next strike. Your uncle who's a politician. Your priest at the church. Your brother, your sister. Anyone could be next to disappear or die. The worst case scenario is extra horrifying though. What if it's all of the above? What if everyone you've ever loved is taken from you all in the same night? What if you're the one left behind, but you go through so much pain and loss that you wish they had taken you too? Welcome to Yugto, a podcast where we get mad over things in Filipino history, especially incidents so heinous and inexcusable that we can barely even talk about the details surrounding them without our heads spinning. Where to even begin with the Sagod Massacre? It already has an ominous enough term in its name. Massacre. The Philippines is rife with massacres, actually, throughout its history. Enough to warrant its own Wikipedia page. And honestly, there were so many massacres during martial law, it could be a whole new season of this podcast by itself. These were mostly attacks on indigenous communities and Muslim towns, where people had no military protection or strong educational backgrounds. But today, we're only going to talk about one that seems pretty emblematic of the entire Marcos regime. Born of corruption, aggravated by the military, buoyed by blatant lies and a host of destroyed lives in the process. Throughout the season of Yugto, We've talked about people who were murdered for various reasons under the martial law regime. For speaking up, for talking about Marcos, for being true to their callings, you name it. Today our story is even worse, because today, it's not about just one death. It's not about a death. But the death of a whole community. Nearly a whole town wiped off a map. And the reason is simple. They happen to be living on a land that a Marcos corporate crony wanted for himself. It is 1981. The atrocities of martial law are well known to everyone around the Philippines now. The deaths and the disappearances are only vaguely referenced in newspapers and usually attributed as being out of defense or down to the person being involved with communists somehow. The residents of Sagod in Las Navas, northern Samar, go about their days normally. They've heard all of the stories, of course. Press freedom or no press freedom. Filipinos sure know how to gossip. But scary things happen in the big city of Manila or somewhere near it or far to the south in Mindanao. Here, in the middle of nowhere, in the lush greenery, it doesn't seem like there's anything to fear. Things have been on edge lately, though. There's been arguments with the San Jose Timber Corporation. It's a bit of a mess, considering that San Jose Timber Corporation is owned by Juan Ponce Enrile, head of the military arm of the Marcos government. Enrile and his military forces, though, they fight for the people. They protect them from communists. There's no reason to suspect that these men will renege on negotiations and turn their guns on them, right? It is September 15. It's the early morning. The birds aren't even chirping yet. This quiet little barrio was still asleep and dreaming. No one is awake to hear them storm into the tiny town, but the aggressive yelling soon rouses everyone. 
burly men were walking around, shouting, demanding that the people of Sagod come out and assemble for a quote-unquote meeting. They wanted every single person out there. Man, woman, child, of all ages. They start knocking violently on doors. They yell and yell, as if they are giving orders to soldiers. Roused and in some cases pushed, the people of Sagod, wearing nothing but sleeping clothes, pile out into the cold early morning. There is a sense of uncertainty, laced with a heavy dread. Mothers hold their children tightly to them, and men stand in front of their wives. There were 18 men there, decked out in gear, carrying guns. The head of this unruly bunch was a Commander Brown, who the people recognized from the lumber company. They wondered what he wanted. There wasn't a meeting arranged today, much less in this hour in the morning. More ardors are barked now. Form two lines. Men in one group, women and children in another. The families look at each other. This seems to be heading in one direction, and no one likes it. But there are guns aiming at them right now. Perhaps couples squeeze their hands before they part. It's going to be all right, they lie to each other. Maybe children hold on tightly to their father's pants, rightly sensing that something terrible is about to happen, before being coaxed onto the other line and told to keep quiet by their mothers. Joining the men in the group were any of the children who knew how to read or write. Did the people of Sagod know that this was because the last thing the attackers needed was anyone who had the education to fight back or write about the atrocities that were about to go down? After the two clear groups are formed, two of the soldiers demand the women and children follow them. The women and children look over their shoulders as they were led into the jungle. They look at their husbands, still standing in a row. It wouldn't be long until they would hear gunshots. Who were these men who had so brazenly marched into Sagod, so confident in their ability to coerce people into doing what they wanted, armed to the teeth and ready to kill? While the group that had hired them was the San Jose Timber Corporation, they went by the title Special Forces ICHDF. Like the San Jose Timber Corporation, they were related to Marcos. The Integrated Civilian Home Defense Forces were instituted by Marcos to act as a paramilitary support group to its various projects that might need defense. As with most things related to martial law go, the ICHDF or sometimes just called CHDF, were just a front. The group was little more than armed thugs that strong-armed their ways into territories, killing, raping, maiming along the way. Some of these members were known to be military men who had pending cases of violence, and some were rumored to be prisoner recruits from different penitentiaries. They now served, supposedly under the orders of Juan Ponce Enrile, Yes, the same guy who owned that lumber corporation, and the same guy who would end up turning against Marcos during the Edsa II revolution, lionizing him and almost seemingly absolving him of all of these crimes that happened under his watch, regardless of who was giving them orders. The group were known for committing atrocity after atrocity, shamelessly, all over the nation, under excuses that they were working to better the security of the nation by ridding it of communist and subversive elements. These were the boogeymen that kept Filipinos up at night. The CHDF numbers 73,000 men across the country. But today, in Sagod, in the service of the interests of the San Jose Timber Corporation, there only had to be 18 of them to wreak unimaginable and unforgettable atrocities. The women and children held each other and cried, but they made sure not to make too much noise, lest it annoy the two men who were guarding them. They weren't that far from the barrio. They had heard the gunshots. 
One after another, the sounds of the bullets tearing into the air non-stop. They heard the screams of the men that they loved. They have no illusions about what's happened, and they have no illusions that they are going to be next. The shooting goes on for 15 minutes. Bang, bang, bang. It doesn't stop. Are the men in Sagod running, trying to escape? Or are the soldiers simply double tapping, plugging away at corpses to make sure they're dead? Soon, majority of the defense force men who were left behind with the Sagod men catch up to this group. There's an exchange between the guides and guards. Then they bark at the women and children to get up and start marching again. In a forested area, the women and children were abruptly stopped. They're told to squat on the ground and await further instruction. Again, the wait, the quiet, the dread, as the 14 men confer with each other away from them. Around this point or just before, Four of the women captives take their lives into their hands and quickly and quietly slip away into the forest. They scramble away as far as they dare without making too much of a commotion, then hide and wait for all of it to be over. The rest of their barrier mates left behind are divided by the men into two groups. The two groups are led away from each other. One of these groups is taken to an elevated area near a stream. Here, the men shout at them to face each other. Finally, they are given words that aren't just orders. It's a question. Where is Commander Russell? The women have no idea who Commander Russell is. They have never heard that name in their lives, and they express so. Again, the question. Where is Commander Russell? The women beg these soldiers to believe them. We have no idea who that is. The men casually tell them that they also are from that communist party and that they're just looking for their fellow man. The women see right through this ruse. They recognize some of these men as being from the CHDF forces, again, including Commander Brown. They all know that these men were acting as security and general muscle on behalf of the lumber company that wants the Sagod land. Who are these men trying to fool now, pretending to be communists all of a sudden? Did the people of Sagod know that this was modus operandi one for the CHDF, and that the others who had perpetrated violence under the name and banner of dictator Marcos? That this claiming to be communist thing happened all too often? That there were all sorts of crimes, like the one happening right now, said to happen because of communists when it was just Marcos's forces themselves doing it. It didn't matter, of course. The questions kept getting barked and still the women of Sagod had no answers. The next order was the answer to their desperate denials. The children are told to step away from their parents. The screaming and the panicking begins again. Desperate children hold on to their mothers. They don't want to go. There was no trying to be quiet now. There was weeping, wailing, more pleading, always pleading. The CHDF forces grab children by their arms and necks. They drag them away and force them into another group. They have no time for these sympathies. The children are forcibly herded off until the only people left in this clearing are the women and a few of the soldiers. The shooting begins then. There is hardly any time to breathe between the time it takes the men to raise their guns and fire the first shots. A 41-year-old woman by the name of Rita was one of those who told the horrific stories of what happened that day. She had only been shot on the right arm as the CHDF purporting to be communists shot at her and the other women she called family and friends. The pain of being shot was unlike anything she had ever experienced. Hot, like lightning. But she held her tongue and stilled her breathing and played dead. Even as the men continued shooting above her, 
even as she felt bits of blood and flesh flick onto her prone back. Even as she saw blood pouring out of her own mother's head. He stayed still for what felt like centuries. Until the shooting stopped and the men left. Rita decides to take the extraordinary risk and makes her way back into the village. On the way, in the greenery, in the jungle, she runs into children, running, crying, not knowing what to do. These children speak of a situation similar to what she had just experienced. She knows now that not all of the children that were led away from her, that not all of the women who were in the second group, will probably make it back. She holds the children's hands and continues making her way back to Sagod. Rita knows that there's nothing good waiting for her back there. She knows she will be walking straight into a site that will mar her psyche for life. But she has to do this. She has survived. It's her responsibility, and it's her curse. In the barrio, the decomposing flesh of the men shine under the afternoon sun. They are piled up one on top of the other, carelessly, around the spot where just this morning the whole town had gathered, hoping against hope that this was just a bad dream. There were children that had made their way back here as well, also hysterical. She now had 13 in total with her. They did not know what to do. They were shaken by what they had just seen. They were wailing. They were screaming. Rita calmed them down, and eventually these few survivors salvaged what they could. They piled onto a canoe and they quietly sailed away from the only homes that they had ever known. Unbeknownst to them, a few hours later, some of the CHDF men came back. They dragged the dead bodies into different houses, and after the square was clean, they set fire to everything. In those short few hours, 45 people were brutally killed. Essentially, the entire Sagod was wiped out. The next day, supposedly Juan Ponce and Rile caught wind of the incident and ordered an investigation. This seems like it would be the good guy thing to do. But note that the story itself did not reach the press or the rest of the Philippines until over a week later. Of course, a week later is all it takes to take a spin to the story. At this point, when the government found themselves having to explain what happened, as usual, they said that everyone in the village was a communist, justifying the wipeout. Ironic, of course, considering the men used the excuse that they were communists in order to take the shots. The massacre in Sagod was horrendous, but it's only the tip of the iceberg as far as the civilian home defense forces are concerned. It is estimated that this general group alone, during the martial law years, committed tens of thousands of offenses. Some of these offenses we know. The majority of them have been lost to history, buried along with bodies that have never been found. Sagod might have been one of those incidents lost to history if those few women and children didn't escape and survive. They told their stories to the press, who spread it far and wide, even to other countries, where grittier details came to light. Some, if not majority, of the women were raped. When the bodies were piled on top of one another, they were dragged here and there first, as if they were no more than trash bags. The town, after the whole incident, was made into a no-man's land, patrolled so that no one could come near, even if they were relatives of those who had died that day. And still, what became of that? Certainly, we don't know if anyone from the CHDF was punished. And the CHDF carried on raping and killing in different parts of the country. How many villages outside of Sagod had to hear these troops pretend to be communists just so they could have an excuse to shoot and kill? How many women like Rita 
How many children who will never be able to wash away the images of that day have to bear the burden of carrying the memories of entire communities that would disappear off the map and the public imagination otherwise? Only 13 people survived the Sagod Massacre. If you think this was difficult to listen to, imagine how many more stories of this nature there are. Imagine how many were torn from their families, interrogated, died, and left to rot under the sun during martial law. It is estimated that there were almost 100,000 cases of violence, death, and torture during martial law. During the Kulantingan Massacre, seven farmers were shot. The infamous Jabida Massacre happened in Corregidor Island, and we only know it because one of the trainees was able to escape. Eleven of his co-trainees died. In Barangay Malisbong, the entire village was set on fire. Three hundred houses set ablaze. The men were herded into the mosque and shot. The women and children either detained or tortured. In Binkul village, over 40 Muslims were shot and killed. And on and on and on and on. If you have any friends or family who support the Marcoses and who describe martial law as the golden period for Filipino history, ask them what they think about these numbers and the names, the people, the lives behind these numbers. Ask them if suspicions of people being communists or the need for big corporations to own land was worth all the gunshots ringing in the air that traumatized survivors for the rest of their lives, if there are any survivors at all to tell the tale. Though the Philippines has seen its fair share of massacres and rape slaves before and after the Sagod one, never did we see such wide-scale, government-sanctioned attacks. To this day, we condemn Marcos and all those who worked under him as paramilitary enforcers or as owners of land-grabbing institutions. We condemn the killings and we remember those who spent their last moments wondering what they did to deserve this. If there are survivors of these massacres, then surely it is up to them to forgive the lieutenants and soldiers who aimed the guns and directed the torches that obliterated their homes from the face of the earth. But we, as citizens of the Philippines, cannot and will not forget or forgive. Thank you for listening, remembering, and getting angry with us today. Yugto is narrated, researched, and written by Sunny, and is supported by the Work in Progress team. Sources and any subsequent correction of facts for the episode can be found on the website. Support us on Spotify, Anchor, and YouTube, or email us for any questions at whipinc.ph at gmail.com. Finally, help us get these stories out there by sharing us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or any social media. Join us next fortnight for another episode. And remember, activism is not terrorism. Truth is not terrorism. See you next time and keep fighting the good fight.